This is the video solution guide to the first sample test. All of the answers are already on Canvas in a written format if you don't want to listen to the video, but if you want verbal explanations of these solutions, then this video is for you. There's 30 points worth of questions and you'll have 40 minutes to answer it. Hopefully with complete explanations, this should take less than 20 minutes. And that should be sufficient time to be able to do all of the questions in the actual test. All right, to the first question. First thing to note is at the bottom of every page uh, for categories and phrases, there will be labels that you can use. So all of the labels you'll need in the first question are at the bottom of the screen. All right, let's talk about the solutions. I won't read out the sentence, but I will talk about the solutions and why they are the solutions. So in the first sentence, we have the, this is a definite article. It is the only definite article we have in English. It's a determiner for the rest of the noun phrase, which would include uh, out the outer gods. So this whole thing is a noun phrase. More here is a qualifier because it's describing the adjective important. It's acting as an intensifier for it. It's more important than something else. Well, maybe not an intensifier, but an intensifier comparison to something else. B. We have ever done it before. So done here is our verb. And we have these two words, ever and before, describing the verb. So hence, these are both adverbs. Now the question is, why is before an adverb when before is also a prepositional word? Well, if we have a preposition before, let's pretend this is a P, then we should have some noun phrase being introduced after it. And if it's not introduced after it, it should have moved somewhere else in the sentence. But uh, this is not the case. This is just before, there's no noun phrase after. This is just talking about the action. Like, when have you done it? Oh, I've done it before. All right. C, in your opinion, what is the most interesting thing? So this is a question. What is the most interesting thing in the entire world? In your opinion is sort of like filler, so we can ignore this. And now we just have a regular sentence. Therefore, this what is going to be either an interrogative pronoun or an interrogative pronoun determiner. Well, this is just a pronoun. It takes the place of an entire noun phrase, what, and then it goes into the predicate. So that means that this is just an interrogative pronoun, not an interrogative pronoun determiner, because then we would see a noun immediately after it. All right, D, sorry, there's not a shred of doubt in my mind that you intentionally ate a delicious dessert in front of me. So in front of me, this is a three word preposition. This introduces the noun phrase me, and you can replace this three word preposition with a two word preposition like next to, or a one word preposition like beside or behind. These are all prepositions of location. All right, in E we have pose later, much more optimistic work. So po here is a proper noun. And then later, well po is later, much more optimistic work. So this later is talking about the work, which means this is an adjective. And you might be thinking, what about this apostrophe S? Well, remember that the genitive S attaches to noun phrases. So the S, the apostrophe S here is not part of the word category, but rather part of the function of the phrase. So the genitive is not something that we consider when we label individual word categories. All right, in F we have the Sahara Desert, which is a two word proper noun. You could include the as part of the proper noun to make it a three word, uh, but that is confusing about whether it's a definite article or a proper noun, so I decided to not include it. And then we have and here. So the question is with and, is it a correlative or a coordinating conjunction? Well, if it's a correlative, we would see the word both around here. We'd say the Sahara Desert is both the largest hot desert and one of the harshest environments, but we don't see that word both. So this is just a regular coordinating conjunction. It stands on its own and it's coordinating the phrases, the largest hot deserts and one of the harshest environments in the world, which are both noun phrases. In G, uh, we have his old campaign motorcycle Wednesday. So motorcycle is a noun and campaign is also a noun. This is a case where we have another noun phrase campaign 
modifying a motorcycle to describe the type of motorcycle, much like we had with police officer or math teacher. In F, didn't you usually buy these? Well, buy here is a verb. So didn't is our supporting auxiliary, and we see this as a contraction. So this consists of our ox do, and because it's a contraction, we have a plus nick. So these are two categories in one word. If we were to say, did not you usually buy these? Then it would be ox do, comma, neg. All right, and finally, I can't believe you dare to defy your own master. So, defy here is the verb, and we actually have a modal here on you'd. So you'd would be a pronoun plus a modal, which means that dare to, in between, a modal and a verb has to be some sort of auxiliary element. And this would be our two-word semi-modal. So, I can't believe that you dare to, I can't believe that you need to, I can't believe that you ought to. Uh, these are all examples of semi-modals. Okay, that's question one. Question two is asking you about whether the underlying set of words form a phrase. And if it does form a phrase, what is the head of that phrase? So the first one, I don't know what this absolute crazy nonsense is about. Well, this absolute crazy nonsense is a noun phrase with the head nonsense. We know it's a noun phrase because we can replace this whole thing with a pronoun. I don't know what it is about. And that tells us that this cr absolute crazy nonsense is a unit. Now, how do we determine the head? Well, we have a demonstrative determiner, which is not going to be the head of any sort of phrase. Uh, absolute crazy, absolute as a qualifier, modifying crazy, which is an adjective. And of course, if we have a noun phrase, uh, we're talking about nonsense here. So absolute crazy is just another phrase modifying nonsense. Uh, the most important word in this phrase is nonsense. Okay, next one. We have uh, when operating power tools without eye protection. But we notice that protection is not part of this phrase. But without is a preposition, and prepositions introduce entire noun phrases. So when we say without eye protection, uh, what's the most important word? after without? Are we saying uh, it's, it's the squint made when operating power tools without eyes or without protection? It's without protection. So protection is the head of the noun phrase that the preposition is including. But protection isn't being included here. So this is actually not a complete phrase, which means that it has no head. Okay, C. Curly was the name of the bald-headed guy that used to play for the Harlem Globetrotters. This is a prepositional phrase headed by the word of. In fact, this is a genitive prepositional phrase. Um, in fact, here we have of and the name of someone. So we could actually rephrase this as Curly was the bald-headed guy that used to play for the Harlem Globetrotters name. We can take this whole thing and turn it into a noun phrase genitive. So that's one thing that we can do with these prepositional phrases that are introduced as genitives. And we'll actually talk about that more in week five, immediately after the first test. Um, but of course, we have a preposition introducing a noun phrase, and that's all you would need to know to get this solution. Next one gets a little bit trickier. It is thanks to people like you. Well, we can say it is thanks to them. So we know that this is a noun phrase, but the question is, what is the head? Is it people or is it you? Well, what's the most important thing? Is it thanks to people that are like you or is it thanks to you who has to be a per who happens to be a person? Well, here the most important word is just people. It's people that are like you. We don't even have to have that in. We could just say it's thanks to people that our team is able to keep the game and community running. Okay. E, the presenters quite rudely attack the audience. Well, quite rudely is an adverb phrase. It describes how the attacking happened, and if we remove it, it's still grammatical. The presenters attacked the audience. And of course, what's the head here? It has to be the adverb, rudely. Remember here, quite is a qualifier. It's talking about how rudely something was done. So this is not going to be a head. And finally, the last one, my apologies, was called an apoloholic. Uh, I'm sorry for the awful pun. My apologies is a proper name, which is a noun phrase, and of course, uh, proper names 
can be more than one word. And if you have a proper name that's ahead of a noun phrase, uh, that head can also be more than one word. So here, the entire head would be my apologies. Don't worry. It's the worst pun in this exam, but it's certainly not the worst pun in the course. That's question two. And like you saw before, the phrases are also listed at the bottom. So question three, here's where we're drawing trees. All of the labels are listed at the bottom as well. And this is where we would see our NP gen if we were to have one. Okay, ought to be resting. Well, I see ought to, I see be, and I see resting. If you remember ought to is a semimodal, resting is a verb, and then be would be our auxiliary be. So this is just a verb phrase and this splits into three branches. This is more of being able to identify that this is a phrase and then identifying the head and the rest kind of falls into place. So we have the semimodal ought to, we have the auxiliary be, and then we have the verb resting. I apologize for my sloppy writing here, but it is written up, so hopefully this is clear enough. B, this eye-catching dress of the show. We're going to take a different approach to this. I want to start from the bottom up. So we have this eye-catching dress at the show. Okay, now how can we put this together? Let's do this from the bottom up so we can figure out a way to create this. So let's label all of our words first. This is a demonstrative determiner. Eye-catching is an adjective. Dress is a noun. At is a preposition, the is a definite article, and then show is a noun. Okay, so what do we know? We know that every adjective, noun, preposition, verb, and adverb will need a phrase. So this means that the adjective will need an adjective phrase. Uh, I don't see any qualifiers beside it, so we can build this straight up into an adjective phrase. This eye-catching dress at the show. Well, we're talking about the dress here, so this happens to be the most important word in the phrase. So this will be the big noun phrase that covers everything. Uh, prepositions, we know that prepositions introduce noun phrases. So this should be a prepositional phrase that introduces a noun phrase. And then how do we build this final noun phrase? Well, uh, it consists of a definite article, the term or the, and then our head noun show. So now it's just a matter of putting these all together. How do we know these all connect to this big NP? Well, this is the determiner for the dress. So we're talking about this dress. Uh, the dress happens to be eye-catching. So we're describing it like that, connecting the adjective phrase to the noun. And then we're saying this is the dress that happens to be at the show. So at the show is also describing where the dress is, which means it also connects to the noun phrase. Both eye-catching and at the show here are different forms of modifiers. And this prepositional phrase modifier is something that we haven't quite seen yet, but hopefully you're able to at least reason about to figure this out. Um, I won't show you anything new on the actual test, but for the sample test, uh, I think it's important to push you a little bit. And finally, the last section is the short answer question, and I won't write all of these down completely. All of the solutions are detailed in the written guide, but I will explain these and point things out. The first question happens to do with whether the following sentence violates any of our six prescriptive rules, and if so, what rules are they? Okay, let's look at this entire sentence. I am always borrowing cash when we all get together and go out to eat, so I frequently forget who I still owe money to. Well, the first bit is fine. You might be thinking, well, what is this we all going here, going on here? But we is plural and all is plural, so this is fine. It's the second bit that's more problematic for our prescriptive rules. So I frequently forget who I still owe money to. Here we see a preposition dangling at the end of a sentence. So this is going to be one of our rules broken. Do not end sentences with prepositions. And because we have a preposition dangling at the end of a sentence, we're probably going to have a violation with the who and whom rule too, which we see here. So how should we be rephrasing this? Well, this should be whom. Why? Because we can say, so I frequently forget to whom I still owe money. Okay, so that would be two rules violated. 
And one last important thing about these questions, I ask you, does the following sentence violate any of our six prescriptive rules? You must explicitly state yes. You must answer the question. Because if you don't say yes, then I might be thinking that you're just saying, well, maybe these are the rules. I'm not 100% committed. You know, you have to explicitly answer the question. Second one, can you use a coordinating conjunction or correlative to coordinate very tall with man? Why or why not? Well, very tall is an adjective phrase, and man is a noun phrase. And the one thing about conjunctions, uh, specifically the coordinating conjunctions and correlatives, is that when you coordinate or correlate two things, they must be the same type of constituent. So we we have to say something like very tall and rather slim, or maybe something like man and his best friend, or man and woman. We can't just say, oh yeah, I met the very tall and man yesterday. Mm, that doesn't make sense. So the answer is no, because we must coordinate two things of the same type. All right, five more points left to go. Create a sentence using the predicate adjective smart. Uh, I like to keep it very simple. I like to just say something like he was smart. If we keep it simple, then you're guaranteeing that what you have is a predicate adjective. If we start making things more complicated or adding more words to it, um, there's a possibility that you'll accidentally come up with a more complex grammatical structure and then what you have might not be a predicate adjective. Uh, it's, of course, not really easy to come up with a more complex structure on your own, um, but it's just better to keep it simple and avoid an issue where I have to look at your test and say, oh no, this should be right, but you made it too complicated. V, in your own words, describe what an abstract noun is. Uh, there's a few different things you could say here. You could get the definition off the slide, that's fine. Uh, something that could be learned, felt emotionally, believed, or understood. You could also say that it's something that cannot be sensed by the senses, or cannot be touched, seen, heard, felt. Um, smelled. Uh, if you just say something like so, uh, a noun that is not concrete, uh, that is not worth a full point because then I'm my question to you is, well, what does concrete mean? Uh, at least give some description. Also, if you just give examples and don't describe what it is, that's also only worth about half a point because I do want to know what it is and not just have examples. Okay, E. Descriptive or prescriptive statements. We don't need to explain our answers here. Uh, people who use improper English, like gotcha fam and you know it dude, have a lower IQ than people who don't. Well here we have the word improper. This is like a prescriptive statement because improper is subjective. It's relative to some standard of English. Uh, even though we know that there is no real standard of English because there's so many different dialects. Uh, so words like improper, proper, bad, good, weird, uh, these are all words that are very prescriptive in nature, or very judgmental in nature, which lead the statements to become prescriptive. These dog out went is an ungrammatical sentence in English. This is just a descriptive statement. And we can say it's descriptive because ungrammatical is not a subjective word. Uh, any speaker of English out there, these dog out went, will know it's ungrammatical. Um, because went out is a phrasal verb that has to be in a certain order. Uh, or you could consider it to be a verb and an adverb, and it's a more restricted adverb of where it could be. Either way you look at it, uh, these dog out went sounds very weird to people who have been speaking English their entire life. And finally, the last question, underline the predicate in the following sentence. Tom's mother's boss, who was very evil, fired all of his employees. So this is all, this is the action of the sentence, fired all of his employees, and the subject would be Tom's mother's boss, who is very evil. Uh, Tom's mother's boss, of course, is the actual person we're talking about, but who was very evil is describing Tom's mother's boss and therefore part of the subject. All right, it looks like this was about 19 minutes, which is perfect. If you have any questions, of course, you just ask right on Canvas or send me an email, and uh, hopefully... If the written guide wasn't enough, this gave a little bit more insight into why we have the correct solutions here. Expect the real test, of course, to be slightly more difficult. As always, when you're in a room with other people under time pressure, it's always going to be more difficult than sitting at home in a relaxed environment and working on things through your own pace.